Welcome everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I'm Locke Sue. I'm professor um, of ethnic studies and the chair of Asian American Research Center. Um, it's, um, well, I want to welcome you to this um, event today on redress and reparations, Black Asian intersections. I want to at this time ask you to please go ahead and um, shut out your phone, put it on silent mode, and, um, and a warm welcome also to the guests on Zoom. And that you please go ahead and submit your questions on the Q and A feature in the Zoom um, as you um, as you think of them, and we'll accumulate them at the end. Um, I want to begin with a land acknowledgement. I want to take a moment to acknowledge that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Chichen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenya Ohlone. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. Consistent with the university's values of community and diversity, we have the responsibility to acknowledge um, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indigenous Native peoples' sovereignty and our commitment to hold the university more accountable to the needs of American Indians and Indigenous peoples. I want to thank our many sponsors um, who made this program possible, starting with the Asian American Research Center, the Asian American and Asian Diaspora Studies Program, the African and African American Studies, the Asian American Law Journal, the other the Othering and Belonging Institute and the Institute of Governmental Studies. Special thanks to them for allowing us to host this event here in this library. The U.S. is as segregated today as it was in the 1940s. The historic exclusion of Blacks, Blacks and African Americans from equal access to education, employment, housing, and other opportunities has resulted in Black households having nine times less in wealth than white households. It has produced huge disparities that persist in home ownership, houselessness, healthcare, education, policing, and criminal justice, among others. California is the first and thus far the only state to examine the compounding consequences of this multi-generational harm and to consider how to address them. In 2020, the state of California established a task force to study and develop reparations proposals for African Americans. The work of the task force is informed by and builds on successful organizing for redress uh, for Japanese American incarceration. We have today two task force members here joining us to discuss the connections between Asian American and Black American communities, histories, and resistance and suggest how people can get involved in this growing reparations movement. We are going to start today with a screening of a film um, called Reparations by John Ozaki. It is about 30 minutes long. After that, we will have a discussion with our panelists, Jovan Lewis and Don Tamaki. I will be introducing them shortly. We'll begin with them. Um, I hope the film provides a good background and context for this discussion. It's a pleasure for me to invite both of our speakers up. Um, Jovan Scott Lewis is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Geography here at UC Berkeley. He received his PhD from um, London School of Economics and is the author of two books, Scammer's Yard, the Crime of Black Repair in Jamaica and Violent Utopia, Dispossession and Black Restoration in Tulsa. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, um, Don Tamaki, who is Senior Counsel in Minami Tamaki LLP. He received his BA and JD from UC Berkeley. Um, he is the co-founder of Asian Law Alliance and was the Executive Director of Asian Law Caucus. He served on the legal team, which reopened the 1944 U.S. Supreme Court case of Fred um, Korematsu, overturning his criminal conviction of defying 
the removal of almost 120,000 Japanese Americans um, uh, in World War II. So welcome. <laughs> Start by asking you just a few questions and then we will go ahead and open it up to the audience and also i have already zoom um question uh, questions from zoom and i just want to take note that we have over a hundred people on zoom so um this is very exciting um this is actually the first event that takes off a series of events to come this month and um i think it, it would be important for us to begin with the discussion of really the task force itself. Um, if you can introduce and tell us a little bit about the formation of the, of the task force, the mandate, and also some of the key foundings um, that was produced. Um, We're gonna go this way, right? <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, I know that the task force was formed in, in 2020, the interim report of close to 500 pages um, was uh, you know, published in uh, recently, right? And then you have last year, and then this year you were working on um, the work of creating recommendations. So can you tell us a little bit about um, you know, the, the work of the committee? Thank you, Locke. Uh, and thank you to Berkeley and uh, this library uh, and for sponsoring this event. And I always want to defer to Professor Javon Scott Lewis <laughs> as being, uh, although I am quite a bit older, he is my mentor uh, in connection with this, this issue. Um, so quick summary. As everybody recalls, on May 25th, 2020, uh, George Floyd's murder was captured in nine minutes of excruciating video. And it triggered the largest protests in American history. And um, by September of the same year, the legislature, legislature had passed in California, um, AB 3121. Um, it was propelled, obviously, by that event, which seared, seared the nation. Um, AB 3121 was uh, created a task force, nine-member task force, of which uh, Professor Lewis and I are two of the members. It has three mandates. First, to document the history of the harm uh, beginning in 1619 with enslavement, 246 years of that, 90 years of Jim Crow exclusion and terror, and decades more of discrimination, both de jure and de facto, and leading basically to today's consequences. So it's basically tracing a through line uh, from the past that explains our presence. The second mandate is to what we're doing now, uh, the task force, is to pour over proposals for repair, ranging from direct compensation to the harm class, as well as dozens and dozens of policy changes um, in 13 different areas emanating from this report that we um, issued. And the third thing was to educate the public. So on June 1st of 2022, Professor uh, uh, Sue mentioned the 500 page report, uh, which is sweeping scholarly and probably unprecedented since the 1968 Kerner Commission report, um, which warned that America was heading toward two societies, one white, one black, separate and unequal and predicted dire consequences if there was not a massive intervention. The report was largely ignored. And so we are living with the consequences of that. This report is um, much more extensive than the Kerner Commission report. About 40 pages of the Kerner Commission report dedicated itself to this connecting the dots through line process. The 500 page report that was issued, and I have a copy if folks wanna take a look at it, um, it is far more extensive, covering 13 chapters, of course, beginning with the transatlantic slave trade, separate chapter on racial terror, separate chapters on housing, health care, administration of criminal justice, pathologizing the Black family, um, and so on. And so our recommendations for repair follows those 13 chapters. 
and that is due on June 30th of 2023. And if it's possible that the second to the last hearing uh, might be on this campus, actually. Um, Professor Lewis is, is working on that. Um, I've, if you Google the California Reparations Task Force, tons of articles now show up. And by the end of June, uh, we will be in the crosshairs, frankly, of, of, of the focus um, of the Fox News folks. But also, um, I think there's a general sense that it's time to at least study this. So that's that's sort of a, a nutshell background on this, and I'll defer to Jovan to talk about the rest. You said it all, Don. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's it's that Fox News well future that I've, which is why I've you know carefully positioned myself to the margins of this panel <laughs> um, and, and place to write it down. But I think that's exactly right. And I, and I, what I will what I would add, and there's really not much to add. Um, that really expert, you know, telling of the history of the task force's formation and the work we've done so far, is that, you know, getting to that report was, you know, a year of us, you know, hearing, you know, really harrowing testimony of personal experience, expert um, witness testimony of the histories of harms against Black Americans in this state, um, going right back to the founding of the state. Um, and so, you know, the 13 chapters that structure the preliminary report or what's called the interim report um, and around which we have based our recommendations comes out of the state's history. So in other words, you know, what we've done is not gone away and, you know, kind of abstractly conceptualize what African-American harms have been um, and what the reparations for those harms should be. You know, we, we have, for those of us, right, who are studying, you know, we have taken an empirical look at the state's history um, and have detailed that history. Um, in 500 pages, and 500 pages isn't enough. And what we are doing, you know, and what we're wrapping up now are coming up with recommendations that respond directly to that history and the ongoing um, impacts um, of that history. And, and one other thing that I was saying, because this came up in that really wonderful documentary, so I, I appreciate us having the chance to show it, and thank you to the director and everybody who took part um, in its creation, is that and this might be a question that comes up a lot, so I apologize, um, is one thing that AB 31, what makes AB 3121 very unique is that it situates the issue of operations with slavery. But it very deftly recognizes that what we really need to pay attention to are the lingering effects of slavery. Because that's one of the biggest challenges that we have, you know, especially as the state of California entering the union as a so-called free state. You know, there's a very legitimate question to be asked is what responsibility does the state of California and its citizens have for a history of slavery, which it did not formally take part in. Um, the history that we uncovered shows that, you know, there was slavery in the state and part of joining the union was, a, you know, signing up for participating in the fugitive slave uh, law that saw California, right, um, deport uh, runaway enslaved persons back to their former masters in the South um, and elsewhere in the country. But this issue of lingering effects, right, and so the history that we've detailed largely, mostly in these 500 pages, is not a history of slavery. It's a history of the exact and precise and directed participation that the state has, you know, engaged in, in regards to, you know, continuing to disenfranchise and harm its black residents. That was yeah, the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, There's a lot more to say about that, so please still ask us. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it, it is curious, you know, that California is the first state that's taking up this work. And um, can you speak a little bit more about why that might be the case and what kinds of implications it would have, you know, for the rest of the country? You want me to start, huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I think, I, I think the, you know, so we're talking about George Floyd and, you know, we have to remember Oscar Grant, right? We have to remember where we are and we have to, we have to remember Rodney King. We have to remember the history of mediatized anti-Black state violence really has its origins in the state of California. 
And, and I'm not saying that anti-blackness and state anti-blackness had its origins in the state of California, but when we're talking about the spectacle of anti-blackness um, at the hands of the state, we understand that going back to Rodney King and then having this inflection point, which is killing of Oscar Grant, right? Um, with the, the mobile phone as this, this great mediator of bringing you know, this practice to the public, California really is at the epicenter of this particular phenomenon that brings us to George Floyd. Um, I think in practical terms, you know, there is of course the composition, you know, of, of state politics, right? There, there is a particular, um, you know, with a largely democratic, um, meaning democratic party, you know, led, you know, state government, you know, with, having a democratic governor, I think there is a particular kind of will that California has and represents that is very difficult to, to replicate elsewhere. Um, and we have to also give a tremendous amount of credit to grassroots organizers, you know, that actually help push, you know, and, and get AB 3121, you know, into, you know, you know I, I guess we don't know, I don't know the full history of, of you know, what now Secretary of State Shirley Weber, you know, was doing in, in, in getting to, you know, helping to author this bill. But what we do know is that there is a lot of, of grassroots organizing, a lot of this kind of activism that, that helped push the state. And then again, with that, we have to look to California's history around organizing and around activism and how impactful that history has been in terms of bringing about societal change um, in the state and then later on throughout the country. The the political framing, just to reiterate a point in the movie, you know, in 1988, uh, Congress did pass the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 for Japanese American redress and reparations. And it was really the product of two bills. One was introduced in 1980 as a study bill to study the what most people had no awareness of, that there were concentration camps in America and American citizens and residents were rounded up and incarcerated there, including my family, my parents, and so on. And so the first bill was a study bill. And then the second bill, after creating the political will uh, and, and background, was the monetary atonement bill. And so in 1989, literally one year after that bill was passed, Conyers introduces the study bill. And for years, maybe one, maybe two co-sponsors. Now it has over 200. Uh, but despite the fact that the House has had a majority uh, of, of Democrats prior to this last election, Congress has not shown the will even to study this issue, let alone do anything about it. So that tells you a little bit something about the racial hierarchy, that when it comes to black people, maybe native people, also, there's not been the will to even acknowledge that it even happened. And so, uh, and that's, that's reflected in the public sentiment. We get hate mail a lot. And the most common is slavery happened a long time ago. It's over, civil war ended, the playing field is level. And this is nothing more than a handout to an undeserving, aggrieved population, a minority. And so, uh, I thought I knew something about American history until the task force, really. It was an eye-opener. And even those who are pretty steeped in it, the, the scholarship of, uh, of the report synthesizes and integrates really the latest research and books on this, literally in the last two to five years. Uh, stuff that's coming up out about now, even though this is like over 100 years, like Tulsa, Greenwood is... 100 years ago, and people are now just now kind of learning about it. And one of the things about the report is America is littered with Greenwoods and Tulsa's, uh, and California too. So uh, it's a matter of educating people. So nothing's happened at the DC level. So then the issue was basically, um, what can California do? Can California lead the nation? And obviously, I think there's a realization on the task force that this is a national issue involving a huge national harm and enormous, if you put an economic number on it, uh, damage. But California had a role in this, too. 
and as Javon uh, stated, you know, it entered the Union in 1850 as a non-slave state, but it was so complicit in the institution. And Jim Crow was imported into California, you know, I mean, by 1920, California was known as a strong Klan state with sizable and violent chapters in San Francisco, Oakland, Los Angeles, Fresno, Anaheim. Uh, and that followed, you know, th with the redlining uh, housing p patterns. If you, there's a chapter on housing and if you align the redlining maps of the 1930s and 40s with the most impoverished and underserved communities in the Bay Area, they align exactly. So these were not, it shouldn't be, it's not a surprise because these outcomes were planned. And so uh, the pattern of, that was set on the national level was followed in California. And in many ways, California was, became a leader in the nation in, in, in separating black and white neighborhoods, segregating them, and thereby segregating housing, uh, segregating uh, education, employment, and everything else. So a little answer. That's great. I knew, you have a slide to show. Oh, us, yes. And um, it's just to move this. The light yeah, so, so can I think Jovan doesn't know about this, but I'm going to put this up. <laughs> so if you look at this graphic, in some ways, you know, it, it's oversimplified. And in and of itself, it can be misleading. Uh, because it begins in 1619, the institution of enslavement, American slavery, almost 90 years of segregation to 1954, which is Brown versus Board of Education when the court outlawed uh, uh, segregated public ed education. And then it, there's a green line, which suggests basically that after that, everything was great. But, you know, Reggie Jones Sawyer, who is a assembly uh, person on the task force, his uncle was a member of the Little Rock Nine. And uh, at that time, as you can remember in Arkansas, yeah, um, uh, those nine children uh, were defied, you know, the, the orders of the school board, the governor of the state and 200, um, a mob of 200 angry people threatening to kill them just because they wanted to register for Little Rock Central High, and that was in 1957, well after the 1954 decision. And as we know, the segregation and all the after effects continued. So uh, Jovan is totally right. It's the lingering effects of all this. So I don't know who designed this graphic, but I thought in a nutshell, this is kind of answers some of the emails we commonly get that, you know, uh, slavery ended in 1865. What's the problem? Uh, so that's that's the only value of that graphic, but I think it makes a point. It does. I mean, it really shows that the legacy of slavery continues, you know, to present and is systematically and structurally built in, you know, into our society. So there's a lot of things that we need to do in order to rework the system, rework the ideas, you know, and principles that we live with, you know, that to ensure that there is justice um, and that reparations are given and granted. Right. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit, I know Don, you are the only Asian American sitting on the task force. And I'm wondering what you see your responsibility is, you know, given your work with redress and the ongoing work of this reparations project. What do you see as um, uh, your role, uh, your responsibility, and perhaps your 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 hopes, you know, for the reparations project? I can't toss this question to Javon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, as Javon knows, I was appointed by the governor, uh, and I actually recommended numbers of other people to to do this, and. Uh, they said, no, we want to interview you and so on and so forth. And, and mainly because um, among all the nine, I'm the one person that has some experience with reparations, redress and reparations. There's no equivalence between four years in a concentration camp and 400 years of oppression 
but there are some similarities that will be helpful. But I can't lie to you, you know, Chavon knows. I ask myself, how the hell did I think I could actually do this? Uh, and, and what is my role? And frankly, people in the audience and probably fellow task members wondered the same question. Not me, done. Oh, yeah. So he keeps lifting me up. Uh, and reminding me that um, we're dealing with a societal issue that has needs a political and cultural solution. Okay, so California, this is population black population is sixteen percent, six percent nationwide, fourteen percent. And so you ask about my role. My role is really to reach out not only to the communities I'm closest with. Asian Americans, lawyer community, those types, but to everybody else, because unless there's a consensus, unless we start this conversation, it's going to be like what's happening in Congress. It's going to be like the current commission report, where it's simply ignored. And so um, that's one of my roles. The other role, um, it's very similar, is is how I talk to for example, Asian Americans who've gone through this, Japanese Americans that have gone through this. And basically I say, yeah, we are concerned with prejudice. We're concerned with anti-AAPI AAPI hate. And I think we, hate, we need to address that. I'm glad it's getting airtime, but we also have to understand where the hate comes from in the first place. And I think the hate does come from um, a place in 1619 wherein in order to prop up the institution of enslavement, this mass dehumanization occurred, reducing people to the level of cattle, pigs and goats, things. And simply put, if you could do that to any group of human beings, then targeting uh, anybody else is easy. You know, name the di disfavored group du jour. And once you could do this to black people, native people, it's easy to do it to anybody else. And so, you know, World War II broke out, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, and suddenly the cannon was pointed at our community. And, and, and uh, it resulted in within um, a matter of months, you know, 120,000 people being rounded up from Berkeley, Oakland, the West Coast, and put into uh, 10 concentration camps from California to Arkansas. And one story I tell to Japanese Americans that they seem to relate to, is you know as to why we should be concerned about that, but I think it's relevant to other groups too, and that is um, two two historical events. So uh, in in 1943, uh, James Wakasa is 65 years old. He's in the same camp as Fred Korematsu, my mother and father, and about 10,000 other uh, Japanese Americans. This is in the des desert Topaz. And so one evening he decides to take a stroll along the barbed wire fence line. From 300 yards away, the sentry draws down on him, takes aim, fires. The bullet strikes Wakasa in the chest, kills him. No inquest is held and um, he's, the sentry is cleared claiming that Wakasa was trying to escape. And two years later, and this is what I picked up in doing the, working on the, the interim report, Odell Short, and his family is moving into a house they built in Fontana, California. And they move in and sheriffs approach them and they say, you know, go back to your black neighborhood. And the real estate agent says to him, if I were you, I'd get my family out of here because vigilantes had a meeting here last night. Something's gonna happen. Two weeks later, the house explodes and neighbors see witnesses uh, seeing Odell Short wife Helen trying to beat back the flames, consuming their nine their nine year old daughter and seven year old son. Everybody in the family dies, and San Bernardino County District Attorney says it was an accident, and the California Attorney General says no vigilante activity could be found. So the question I ask Japanese Americans in particular is, what ties these historical events together? And I think the answer is that, yeah, slavery ended in 1865, but it morphed into the different forms of hate 
that put a target on the backs of not just African Americans, but any other people of color or disfavored group, including James Wakasa. That's the connection. And this thing sort of ebbs and flows and it's created, and the movie talks about a racial hierarchy. That's exactly what has happened. And that's what makes reparations an issue relevant to all of us. It's not, it's not a black issue. It's basically an issue of what it means to be an American. And, and uh, this perennial racial pathology that continues to ebb and flow. So um, it's a short answer about my role on the task force. But... No, thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Jovan, I'm going to turn to you okay. and ask about your responsibilities, you know, and your role. <laughs> Especially being yeah. you know part of this academy, right? Sure. Being in the educational system and what you see, um, the role of Berkeley, you know, or right. the UCs in California playing a role right. um, in all this, and with you, you know, being one of the champions of, of, of this project. Yeah, thank you, Locke. Um, you know, so like Don, I'm also a, a governor appointee, and um, you know, part of it is that apparently he could only have appointed one academic. <laughs> I mean, we get it, right? Um, but, you know, so for me, I took that very seriously. You know, I, I, I wanted to make sure that, you know, in, in the process, we understood, you know, when we think about white supremacy, when we think about, you know, colonialism, when we think about the, the kinds of intellectual projects that actually form the United States, we have to remember that they are intellectual projects, mm -hmm. right? These are certain people having a certain idea about the world and how it should be, and having gone about the often very violent work of executing, you know, that vision of how they thought the world should be. And, you know, in that process, what we saw was the muddling and the confusion of all other kinds of people's worldviews and circumstances within the world. And so, we end up with something like African-American slavery that, you know, is really complicated. You know, it is, you know, so you, you say there's no equivalence between four years and 400 years. And, and that's true. And I think what you mean when you say that, Don, is in terms of like the trauma and the impacts. But also, you know, what I would add is that there's a conceptual difference between what it means to have internment for four years and the ongoing complication of four centuries of oppression. Um, and so the responsibility is actually trying to maintain a clear, actually, you know, theoretical and conceptual imperative throughout the process. So when we're thinking about reparations, what does that mean, right? When we're thinking about eligibility, what does that mean? Who are we talking about? Because we're saying African-American and Don is saying there's 6% black population in California, but what does that actually mean, right? Um, and so my responsibility, I, I have seen it as, as really, you know, doing the work that academics do, which is, you know, taking time, you know, observing, trying to think clearly, right, a, around the kind of conceptual terms of the issue at hand and trying to think from those terms and, and to kind of create a system of analysis and hopefully a, a program of action. And so, you know, I'm also, I'm also Jamaican. <laughs> Right, um, which is surprising to some people. <laughs> um, and, and I've, you know, and like Don, Don and I, you know, Don and I, because of our respective backgrounds, you know, are actually similarly situated. Um, you know, there's there's a story where after one meeting, there's an African American woman who came to us both and thanked us for being good allies, you know, to the black community. And I was like, that's interesting, you know. But <laughs> you know, and, and so. My other responsibility is trying to bring somewhat of a global perspective, you know, to the work of the task force mm -hmm. is to say that, you know, the history of civil rights in this country, you know, has been one of all kinds of solidarities. Mm -hmm. If we think about, you know, people like Shirley Chisholm and Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael, you know, you have people of, of, of Caribbean background in, in, in that. And I'm not trying to, you know, say, you know, I'm Jamaican, so, you know, there is a thing. Um, but to say that there is, there are global lessons 
and global perspectives that should be brought to something that seems as you know particular as California reparations. And so I see those as my two sets of responsibilities. One is doing the good work of, of a decent academic, which is to say, well, let's actually understand the concepts at work here. Um, let's maintain a fidelity to you know clear thinking and then other the other is to kind of think you know as as globally as we can and learn from these global you know projects uh, around liberation for thinking about you know african american you know reparations in the state mm -hmm. yeah I, I think you it's absolutely true you know that the, the multiple intersections of um asian american and black mm -hmm. communities you know through the years i'm thinking about Frederick Douglass when mm -hmm. he spoke against, you know, exclusion laws, right. for instance. And, you know, we have Yuri Kochiyama working side by side mm -hmm. with Malcolm X, mm -hmm. Grace Lee Boggs, mm -hmm. and another person. So on and on, you know, with mm -hmm. multiple um, intersections and, and, and coalitions and alliances that I think often get ignored, you know, right. um, in, in the academy or even in media, you know, resources that you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. There is a, a question. Um, there is a question that we have. From, there are a number of questions we have from, from the Zoom, but I'm going to go ahead and and um, read uh, a couple of them, and then I would like to also um, gather questions from um, the audience as well. But um, here's one from Carlos Mays: How are the California AAPI and Black caucuses working together on reparations at this point? That's a question. The uh, AB 3121 was, uh, of course, supported by the Legislative Black Caucus as well as the AAPI Legislative Caucus. And so, at least on the political level, there's an alignment. Um, we've been encouraging um, endorsements of reparations, the task force, the work, this groundbreaking report that we did, or at least the mission and the study of reparations. And that uh, list, um, it, it can be found on supportreparations.org, supportreparations.org. There's about 140 mainstream and grassroots organizations ranging from, you know, uh, psychologists, associations and academics to um, social service organizations to civil rights groups like ACLU and uh, the Bar Associations, for instance. And very heavily represented on that list are AAPI groups. And in particular, you know, there's probably a couple dozen Japanese American organizations. And so there's at least a kernel of, of um, organizing and coalition building going on. But I have to also point out that the racial pathology infects everybody. I mean, no one's free from bias that this thing, you know, that, that, that this phenomenon originating, at least in North America at 1619, continue to pass on. So, uh, and that infects each of the other communities too. I mean, the LA City Council issue uh, was a clear example of that. The Memphis um, police issue, uh, again, captured on videotape. Um, stuff that goes on between uh, the AAPI and the black community, especially in urban areas where the two neighborhoods align right next to each other. Um, there is a back and forth going on. And so we, we have to grapple with that. I, I don't think anybody, you know, it, it, it caused us to have a set of biases. I guess the term jargon now is implicit bias that, that has to be addressed. So um, so it's it's a mixed bag, but I would say that the opportunity for mutual support is there on the table, and it is building. Thank you. There are a couple of questions around um, the actual um, recommendations, and they have to do with questions of monetary reparations for um, Black people in, um, in in California and also the idea of the 0% home loan. And, um, you know, where are they? How do they help or not help? Um, the one around about the 0% uh, home loan, and what use is that if, um, uh, if people don't have the money to even place down, down payments, for instance? And, you know, is, it, is monetary reparations really serious, um, seriously being considered in California? Um, and if you can speak to, I think those are kind of 
mm -hmm. the, the, the nitty gritties, you know, mm -hmm. of the recommendations, but maybe you can also talk about the principles that are guiding the kinds of recommendations um, or reparations. Yeah, so that's an important question. You know, in, in many regards, that's the question, you know. Um, there is, you know, what I'll, I'll, I'll begin the answer to say that, you know, the, the task force, you know, as a principle, um, because really it comports with, you know, what we can think of as the kind of international standards for reparations, right? The question of compensation and direct compensation has always been a kind of agreed to principle. You know, the, the difficulty is, well, how do you actually compensate, you know, for, you know, what we're thinking of as four centuries of, of harm and, and really complicated attempts at responding to these harms, which actually reproduce different sets of harms, right? And so, you know, for us, we, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we looked at the history of California in, in, in identifying around 12 areas, 13-ish areas of, of harm. Where we've created, we've created, you know, recommendations directly responding to those areas. One of the questions that we asked was, which of these areas, you know, or which among these areas, right, you know, would it be appropriate to respond to through direct compensation, you know? And so, in 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 in, in principle, we asked that of every single of the twelve areas, and you know, so we have. Uh, a team of economists, um, you know, who've been working with us over the past year to kind of, you know, help and past year and a half almost um, to answer this question. And they've come up with a set of methodologies um, to respond directly to this issue. And so, you know, what we are, were able to identify is that of the 12 areas, um, the, there are five that, you know, some kind of, you know, faithful methodology could come up with to, to you know, could be come up with to respond to economically. A couple of examples are, you know, the, the issues of, of health disparities, you know, housing discrimination, property loss, the devaluation of black owned businesses, mass incarceration. Um, the idea is that these should be seen as much as they are cultural harms and, you know, social harms, um, they should be seen as economic harms, right? And so mass incarceration is one example that might be somewhat hard to wrap your mind around. You know, when you have a system of surveillance and criminalization and incarceration um, that primarily targets African-American men, what you're doing is you're actually, you know, taking away, you know, Black communities and Black households' ability to actually earn. Then you have these, these individuals formerly incarcerated who are returned to society and, and as a result of being formerly incarcerated are, are effectively unable to equally participate in the economy. So what you have is an economic harm. Mass incarceration should be seen as an economic harm. And so we can think about the same with health harms, right? We can certainly see this being much more reasonably understood around the devaluation of, of businesses, you know, around housing. And when we're thinking about housing, you know, we're talking about the impacts of them in the domain, right? The fact that, you know, African American communities, you know, were, you know, victim to predatory inclusion, predatory lending, you know, so the economists um, and the advisory group, you know, with, that worked with the economists from the task force of which I was a part, you know, Establish a set of methodologies about how we could, you know, account for these losses. And, and I say losses very intentionally, because what we're talking about is that we should understand that the compensation that is a part of a reparations proposal is not a payment. It is effectively a reimbursement, right? It is, it is a, a compensating for the losses of the community. And so what we're talking about is that you know, whatever number is come up with, and, and the job of the task force was not to come up with numbers, right? The responsibility for the, the task force was to come up with methodologies that the state could then employ, you know, to come up with numbers. And that's what we recommended, um, you know, as of our last meeting, you know, we will be making our final vote on those recommendations um, at our May 6th meeting, hopefully to be here at UC Berkeley's campus. Um, so the idea is, that we have, you know, come up with methodologies that directly respond to these identified and studied harms that have impacted these communities. We have been recognized, you know, as harms that can be uh, appreciated 
um, and should be appreciated as economic losses to the African-American community. And so therefore, any recommendations that the state, you know, um, or sorry, any, any action that the state takes in terms of um, putting forward, you know, financial compensation should be seen as a response to the economic losses of these communities. Um, you know, and so I think the, the question is, you know, how do we think also about this, this issue of financial compensation? And we tend to have, we tend to have um, really inconsistent principles as a society around this question of money and which communities deserve money. And, you know, I was, I was in conversation with one of our task force members, you know, during our last meeting, and I made a point, you know, to, the, to, to my colleague, just, you know, saying that, you know, at the heart, because we're talking about San Francisco and the fact that San Francisco's Reparations Commission recently um, suggested, um, you know, $5 million to Black San Franciscans for reparations, and everybody, you know, was really upset about that. Um, and I said, okay, first of all, we get it. That's a big number. And, and, you know, but what's at the root of that number? What's at the root of the anxiety, at the consternation around that number? And the point that I made to my colleague was that we are dealing with a society that is entirely accustomed to getting everything from African-Americans for free, mm-hmm. beginning with the labor and slavery and beginning with the continuing benefits of African-American contributions. And that was a thought that I had while watching the documentary. And so one of the individuals made the point that African-American attempts at seeking rights for themselves, right, have been to the benefit of other communities. In economics, we would call that an externality. You know, the fact that the labels of African-Americans continue to benefit society, um, really at no cost to the society. And so it's not surprising that we have such difficulty reconciling that there should be a monetary value associated um, with African-Americans' history of harm or that they should be owed anything called, you know, financial compensation. Yeah, that's really powerful. I'm going to open it up. Um, there are a couple of hands. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Will Holmes. I'm an Oakland resident. I've lived in the Bay Area since 1999. And I'm a native of Philadelphia. Um, I'm curious to know if any of the past, first of all, thank you for all the work that you've done. I'm curious to know that if many of the past was work, You've looked at examples, the historical examples of African American family success mm-hmm. and intergenerational wealth transfer mm-hmm. as potential models for solutions. Before you answer, can I just hear the other questions as well? And then we'll try to group them together. Um, yes, back there. Yes, if I may, I wanted to recommend a commentary that I wrote for the San Francisco Chronicle a number of years ago about the reparations. And I'm going to say, I think it was an excellent commentary. I hope that will spur people to go read it. I'll just read two example sentences from it. The arguments for reparations aren't made up on the basis of whether every white person directly came from slavery. The arguments are made on the basis that slavery was institutionalized and protected by law in the United States. No government would make the descendants of each beneficiary pay the descendants of each victim or even an inhumane national policy whose effect remained. Governments make restitutions to victims as a group or a class, just like they did with the uh, descendants of uh, Japanese American attorneys. I, I also want to say uh, my apologies. I came in under the uh, documentary late, and your panelists provided specific examples of what I'm about to add. Ask. But the documentary talked about, you know, we need to be aware of, specific, of systemic racism. And at least in the part of the documentary I heard, usually in the case of most documentaries, it wasn't specific. And so I wish the documentary uh, had been more specific about systemic racism, such as the fact that today private banks engage in a practice of loan discrimination and financial discrimination, and how that affects black people. I saw a black neighborhood where all the houses were, were well maintained, but all the garages were like falling apart. And my only conclusion was that these middle class black people could not get home improvement loans. That you saw this like this obvious difference between the houses and the garages. The last thing I'll say is that the current commission said we were moving toward two separate Americas. At the time of the current commission, there were already two separate 
America is very deeply entrenched. And the Kerner Commission said that Black so-called underclass communities were created and maintained by white racism. My question to your panelists is, uh, I once contacted a, a very prominent Black law professor who won Face the Nation, something like that, spoke about a few bad apples. And I'm one of the people in this country that I hope helps send that phrase to the dustbin of history that we no longer talk about that with regards to police forces. Uh, uh, one of the panelists, I'm sorry, I don't recall your name, was talking about implicit bias. I think we should send implicit bias to the dustbin of history because I, as a black person, I can tell you it never looked implicit to me. It was always explicit. <laughs> Good point. Thank you. Um, just to, we're at time, um, but I do want to give an opportunity to hear the questions and maybe a couple of minutes for you to answer so, them. Can I just say, my commentary was called, The Issue is Racism. And as at the San Francisco Chronicle, you can Google that, or The Issue is Racism and Reparation, Joseph Anderson. That's cool. my name. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, yes, back there. Yeah, you. Uh, yeah, yes. I wanted to ask, what is the value of asserting Asian Asian American identity or Asian American struggle is playing parallel to the struggle of black people in the United States. Um, so the kind of thing is like, there's a reason why the descendants of Japanese people that were incarcerated were given reparations. And um, I think I haven't seen, I, I, I don't know, I, I've seen a lot of ways that when Asian American struggle was like the parallel in when in, when we talk about solidarity, it does a lot to like abstract anti-blackness or like blackness as like a central kind of claim. Um, so I wanted to ask like what have y'all I mean have y'all seen the value of kind of black Asian type of like collaboration or like that way of sort of you know uplifting this as like oh yeah you know these are similar things as something that's been like fruitful. Um, and, you know, that's obviously in conversation with like stuff that happened with the school board and the recall of the dean and all of that, like the claims of Asianness sort of being pitted against like, you know, black liberation essentially. Um, so yeah, that's the question. Like what is the value of doing that? And has, have you all seen it as something that has been really fruitful and valuable to approaching those like difficult conversations. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and just two other questions. And Stephen, you had one also. Mm -hmm. So three quick questions, if yeah. you can keep them short. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm Sam here, and on behalf of the uh, Native American community, I support both of your struggles. I've, had, I've known many Japanese Americans who grew up in internment camps, and so very familiar with that. And of course, I've had many African-American friends and I know you guys can keep something. But my question is this, with the way America behaves in Haiti, and I'm sure you're very familiar being Caribbean, mm -hmm. do you really think that anything really of value could come out since there's such international, you know, uh, discrimination, right? you know, and, and, the removal of Aristide, uh -huh. the so-called putting in of peacekeeping troops, which are not peacekeeping troops, they're helping gangs and an illegal government. And I'd sure like to know your opinion on that, because I think that is very central to this whole struggle. Without internationally uh, be changing our behavior toward Hades and Africa, and Hades is in our backyard. So I really want to stress that. How can we really yeah. succeed in anything in this country? That's right. Not to stop, but I'm just saying yeah. <laughs> those things need to be addressed. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you for all your efforts on this occasion. My question is does the work of also address uh, who benefited from all these like harms that are in mm -hmm. our community? Um, I'm like thinking of practices like uh, block of the red light. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Any sort of like mandate, like whether it's like actually. Financially required, or like, not even so, but right. still, like you're committing, you're giving some sort of commitments, like from the government. Like, is there some, some, some sort of um, as explicit mentioning of like who actually benefited all from all these? Things? The yeah. answer is yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
And Stephen, last okay, question. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I have a question about gender and black women. And I recall that Angela Davis said that black women were exploited economically in the fields in exactly the same way as black men. However, black women were exploited, she said in her own language, in ways that only women could be exploited for the reproduction of the workforce. So I'm curious as to whether, as to what extent, issues of gender and women in terms of economic compensation, to what extent they featured in task force discussions or are likely to feature. Thank you. Those are a, a wide range of questions. So okay. I'm gonna let you go ahead and choose. And, and of course, you know, after the, the end of the formal event, we can always um, yeah. you know, mull around and have sure. informal conversations as well. Will there be snacks? Um, <laughs> there will That's be snacks. Question, yes, Stephen. there will be snacks and drinks. So okay. please um, stay after, but let me, I, let me I give th you I think quickly, just to respond to the first question, and thank you for it. Um, you know, so there are, you know, there, there are histories that the report details you know of of what you call african american success you know unfortunately what what we have to move into in those histories is their continued interruption um and so you know we we talk about you know really at the founding of the state you know some what we can call pioneer you know black families that you know just 50 years following emancipation you know are actually large landholders in the state of california um here in northern california in, in, you know uh, precisely and so you know, we do we do detail those histories. However, your question is is you know, do those examples arise to the level of a model? And and I'm afraid the answer is no, right? I mean, in so many ways, we are we recognize that actually African Americans time and time again have created and represented you know very productive models for creating their communities um, and creating what we can think of as intergenerational wealth. It just seems that every time that we get to some kind of critical mass of that happening, there's another policy that is introduced to interrupt that process. So I think in many ways, and this is part of my responsibility actually, you know, and at least I've tried, is to kind of encourage, you know, um, the community, you know, who take part in our public meetings to kind of actively think about this history, to say that, listen, this is not a history of, of African-American people being enslaved and being kept in, in, in positions of subordination. You know, time and time again, you know, African-Americans have created communities that have been healthy and have been thriving and have actually represented the quote unquote American dream, you know, um, as, it, as it were. Um, they've just continuously been impacted by, by racist policies. Um, so I think it's in there, but, you know, not framed as a kind of model for, for reparations and and you know a part of that is 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 that there's a limited scope to what the task force is meant to to do right and so part of that last question you know is and what i think one of the the the, the frustrations personal frustrations is that you know we are actually limited to state harms right and, and so this is not the task force being able to go after the real estate industry and the banking industry and so forth this is us really being limited to state harms and policies of harm um, that have been produced by the state. And so I don't know what, I don't know, you know, if the legislature would want to open up the scope, you know, when they, when they kind of, you know, have, have this handed to them in, in uh, you know, in a couple of months, but that's something that I think can actually, you know, further, you know, interrogate the question that you asked, the, the last question about who benefited, um, because a lot of who benefited, um, you know, aren't really, fully captured they are referenced but in terms of identifying culpability and and, and naming responsibility um the, the task force is unfortunately limited to identifying state arms and, and, and complicity of the state in reproducing arms against african americans in terms of messaging and storytelling yeah. i think it's important though to get out to the word that there are those stories of success and right absolutely and, uh, absolutely absolutely Thank you. Last word. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the specifics, um, including the private actors that uh, work hand in glove with government. Uh, and I, I, I can appreciate the fact that the movie uh, sort of didn't go into a deep dive into the areas, but it, it really is in this thing. And uh, you can access reports online through California Reparations Task Force then scroll down, it's a little bit complicated, but under reports. And there is the full, you know, 500 page deal and there's a 29 page executive summary to take a look at. And as far as uh, 
the cooperation and coalition building between uh, organizations. Um, it, it's, it's a mixed bag. I mean, we've got uh, uh, people uniting around this concept of reparations and the focus being uh, especially uh, toward the descendant community of, of, in terms of the eligibility question. But at the same time, the landscape is a, a situation of, of people sometimes, you know, sticking up for their own race, frankly, uh, AAP, Asian Americans included, and not seeing the connection that, um, that some of the things that have targeted them and us and other people really originate from the same problem that remains unaddressed. So that, that's the challenge of how to frame it. So we could see the bigger picture. Okay, last and, and so last, last <laughs> word, and, I'm, and, and Don knows this, this guy, so I'm gonna, he's gonna chuckle at this. Um, but to, just to respond to your question quickly, and not really to give you an answer, because you know, history is the answer to your actual question. Um, but I wanna, I wanna just you know, shout out my, my eight-year-old son, who when we were seeing in the news you know, several months ago about what was happening in Haiti, he was watching it. And you know, unexpectedly, he said to me, you know, Dad, you know, what's happening reminds me of Hawaii. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I said, what do you mean, son? He's like, you know, it reminds me, because he saw a documentary. He's like, it reminds me of when the U.S. government went into Hawaii and used the military to take over, you know, to take over the country. That's what it looks like what's happening in Haiti, mm -hmm. um, you know, today. Um, and so, you know, we have to think about militarism. We have to think about that, especially coming out of the state of California. Um, we have to think about that as being, you know, one of the primary motivators and, and facilitators of, you know, colonialism and ongoing racism. We have to think about that when we think about the police, um, you know, as a particular kind of force that maintains what MLK called the internal colonies of, of the Black American ghettos in the United States. And so that, that is a continued action. And so we should think about this imperial thrust continuing, um, though seemingly in municipal ways that may not be easily recognized as, as being, you know, imperial and militaristic. Um, in, in, in most, I think, conventional notions. Yeah. So thank you uh, so yeah. much. Um, we can go on for hours yeah. you know, to talk about this. So, um, um, and thank you all for joining us. And I want to also thank our staff um, that made this program possible, Deborah Lustig and Max um, Vanderwaal.